Well, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Columbia Basin Trust Resident Directed Grants Public Input and Engagement Session for the Village of Elmont. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your Sunday afternoon and all of the work that many of you have put into these applications. So again, thank you for helping to vote. Thank you for helping to bring these projects to life in Valmont. Uh, my name is Eric Depno. I'm the Chief Administration Officer for the Village of Elmont and very grateful to be out here with you. I, I might be a new face to some. I, I joined you in just in July, so uh, nine months, less than a year, and uh, loving every minute of out, out here in the valley, so thanks for having me. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce a familiar figure to yourself, uh, our Mayor, Owen Torgerson, to offer a few remarks ahead of getting started. Thanks, Eric. Um, as mayor and also the regional district's uh, appointee to the Columbia Basin Trust Board of Directors, I'm, I'm doubly excited to join you today in uh, listening and taking in the presentations from all the applicants. As you know, the trust was formed uh, just shy of 30 years ago, uh, and from inception until and still to this day, the trust is here to support the ideas and the people of the basin. It's not an easy task to uh, present to community members and uh, speak in front of groups. So please, uh, with every application, whether it's you don't agree with their content or not, please uh, give them some support and, and applause. Also, as uh, to the adjudication committee members, uh, you'll know that the program this year is undersubscribed. But it's even harder for, a, for an adjudicator to look at an application knowing that you have some funds that may be left over at the end of the day, and that's not necessarily granting every applicant the, the, the money that they've been asking for. So with that, I'd like to thank the adjudication committee uh, with us today, and if you want to stand or give it just a wave, uh, Curran Thomas. Eugene Jamin, Sherry G, not with us today, uh, Shay Carlson, and from uh, Council, Councillor Hugo Mullick. So enjoy, uh, applicants have a good time presenting. I look forward to hearing every uh, one of your applications and your ideas and looking for uh, to support them. Thank you. So, so many of you will be familiar with the program and some of the process here, but we'll just talk through the amounts and how we're going to conduct business this afternoon and the timeline ahead. So f the funding program, uh, here we have funds that are distributed from the Columbia Basin Trust to the Village of Elmont to help, as uh, the Mayor said, in local priorities. The Village sets criteria, deadlines, and a public process to use in reviewing these applications. And the input that's taken here, as well as the adjudicators, goes together toward Council, who then will make the final decision. This year, as mentioned, the total available is $248,000. Pardon me, $248,580. So just shy of a quarter of a million dollars are going to be available for public projects. This year, we have eight applications with a total dollar request of 213376 And we're very specific in the crowd, 60 cents. So. <laughs> Um, this public input process gives the opportunity to learn about the projects that have been submitted and how to allow the applicants an opportunity to address any questions that may be out there um, around the project and its specifics. In terms of voting, it's going to look a little bit different this year than what it might have in the past for those that have been through this before. Um, there are two ways that a person can vote. Um, so just at the front door, there were QR codes that a person could use from their cell phone to go to an online portal or you could also use the paper form. So if you don't have those, they're just at the doors to the atrium. Uh, feel free to grab them during our intermission or if you don't have them already. To be eligible to vote, you need to live inside of Valmont or the Regional District Area H. So that covers most of the, the grounds around us. If there's any confusion on it, uh, just come find one of us and we can help you, help you see if, that, if you're eligible. Uh, no matter what method you use to vote, we ask that you score every one of the applicants. So on your form, you'll have eight different uh, groups. Zero is that lowest level of support. You don't want to hear another word about it. Five is that highest level. You've already written them into your will. This thing is going to happen one way or another. So, so that's the scoring from zero to five. 
Um, we, and again, we just ask that you really do mark down every single applicant. Um, for the folks that are marking, we, we can't use that form if it's not complete. So do please fill out every applicant. Um, for presenters, today your timelines. So you have a maximum of five minutes to present. At the four minute mark, uh, Tracy, who most of you will be familiar with, has a sign that she's going to hold up. Just letting you know that there's one minute left, so hopefully that's a little bit friendlier than the uh, light that'll pop up, but we're, we're, here to, we're here to help as best we can. So, so at the four minute mark, you'll see that yellow sign. And once your time has reached the end of that five minutes, we have a, a stop sign that will flash to you. So we just encourage you to, to wrap up your comments there and we'll be able to, to move on. Um, once that happens, the adjudication committee has a question or two that uh, has been pre-submitted, so I'll, I'll read those out. You'll have a chance to answer, and then we'll be able to take a few questions from the public. So we're, uh, we're fairly um, a smaller group than we've had in past public consultations, so we'll, we'll look to start with two questions and see how time's going from there. And once half of the applicants have gone, so after number four, we'll take a brief intermission, and you can help, uh, help sponsor folks to go to Camp Phoenix and support the Youth Parliament. We thank you for that. Um, one other note, uh, so you do see two microphones out in the crowd. So for those that are, are hard of hearing in the room, or especially for those that are listening today at home, we just ask that you do move to a microphone, um, if at all able to ask your questions. Uh, if, if you're not able to for a mobility reason, we'll attempt to repeat it there just so folks at home can hear and we have that uh, full record. I think that's everything we have and we're, we're ready for applications to start their presentations. Anything that I'm missing? Seeing none, um, in a random order, the first group that we have up is the Valmont Learning Society. So I invite them to come take the stand. I am definitely shorter than Eric. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I'm Corey Marshall. I am the uh, chair of the Valmont Learning Society. Um, I've also been operating our Village Greens growing container for a, almost a year now. Um, and this is Sonia Groening. She's joined us a um, little over a month ago, and she's doing a great job learning stuff in the container and helping me and selling lots. Much appreciated. Um, so our project, so the Village Greens um, growing container, we are growing fresh lettuce, herbs, and other fresh leafy greens year round. Um, and we think it's, a, it's an, an exciting opportunity to help address food security in Vailmount. Of course, it's not the whole answer, but it's a part. Um, and what we wanna do is install solar panels to help offset the electric bills for the growing container and to make it a more green and sustainable project. So the Learning Centre, um, the Valmont Learning Society, has been providing services to the community since 1997 and is adapting to meet changing needs. We currently provide youth program, the VCRU, um, ESL and adult literacy and manage the Valmont Farmers Market and the Nutrition Coupon Program. And Village Greens is our newest program to help increase local food security and to expand our programming. This is my part. <laughs> uh, so we sell to local subscribers. It's a weekly pickup um, and restaurants and stores. Uh, we donate our surplus harvest to local programs such as Meals on Wheels, the school food programs, the food bank, and the farm free food stand um, located at the uh, community services office. Uh, due to COVID-19 and related challenges, we have delays in setting up the project and our sales are not quite yet covering our operational costs. And we've done a few things to increase that. Uh, lately, we have uh, a bunch of different, um, we're on social media, we're on Facebook and Instagram, and uh, we're just developing that. And, and we found that's really helped a lot and we're working with um, the Best Western for example to supply uh, all their needs for over the summer for their lettuces as well as still supplying um, for our local 
uh, for people individually for their nutritional needs through the subscription program, as previously mentioned. <laughs> and also we, um, um, yeah, the, the selling to the restaurants, we also do the um, food truck, Dave's the goat mm -hmm. in the summer, and that has helps us uh, provide, you know, cover the basic costs, and then we can also provide locally for people. So these are a couple of pictures of uh, our growing container. That's um, some of our leafy lettuce and dill that's growing right in our container. And this is some microgreens that we've um, been doing a little bit of experimenting with. And this is some of our harvest from just a couple weeks ago. And if you're looking to either sign up for our subscription program or you just want to drop in and pick up um, a piece or a couple pieces of fresh greens, um, we are Tuesdays from 3 to 6 in the, in the garage at Juniper Square. Um, yeah, so either subscription. We have some of our subscription forms out on the table. If you're interested in that, you can take those with you and uh, bring them back to us. Either uh, at the pickup day or to the Learning Center office. So we are asking for up to $40,000 to purchase and install solar panels. Um, we've received three quotes so far and awaiting a couple more. Um, and we'll choose the best option um, depending on how much funding we're approved for. Um, also, we've got a, um, one local um, quote and we do like to to support locally if we can at all. Um, there's a couple of other local people that we might uh, look for further quotes from as well, just to uh, make sure we're getting the best deal for the money that we do get. Oh yeah. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, well, I couldn't mention in our presentation earlier because we, it wasn't announced yet, but we have been approved for an electric vehicle. Um, it's an, another funding program from Columbia Basin Trust. Um, so we're, if we're approved for the solar panels for the growing container, we would look at um, whether we can put this charging station for the electric vehicle there as well, because we'll be using that electric vehicle to help deliver um, the Village Greens to local people. What, a big thing we've heard is that people forget to come <laughs> Tuesdays, <laughs> 3 to 6. We understand this. We forget it too. <laughs> If we, yeah, okay. <laughs> so th thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, to start, we have two questions from the committee. Uh, the first is, are batteries included in the project for power storage? We uh, didn't ask for quotes on batteries. We weren't planning to install batteries. Um, I think a lot of people think that you do need batteries with solar, but you don't necessarily. It depends a lot on if you weren't already grid tied, um, you would need batteries to make sure that the solar, the sun would charge the batteries and then the batteries are there to use later when the sun's not out. Um, but since we're already grid tied, this would be supplemental. So no, we're not uh, planning to install batteries with at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the second question from the committee, how will the maintenance fees on the solar panels be funded? Yeah, the Learning Center, um, the Learning Society would look after that. Um, right now we're paying around $900 a month in power bills. So if the solar panels can offset you know, half of that, hopefully more, then we have lots of extra funding to um, maintain the solar panels. Um, but at really trying to offset that 900 bucks will help, um, help make sure that the container is um, sustainable going ongoing and uh, help us be able to um, supply some of our produce to those local programs. At this time, are there any questions from the crowd? Time for a few questions if anybody would like to ask. Give it a moment, the people warm up. <laughs> a, a second time, any, any questions from the crowd for this presenter? All right, well, seeing none, thank you so much.
is a height difference there. <laughs> um, ne next up on our list, we have the JCR Adult Committee Society. Hello, we are here representing the Junior Canadian Rangers. Let me introduce the JCRs that are present here today, not in any particular order. I have Jaden Hahn, Madeline Bricker, Katie Mintz, Isabel Alexander, Jaden Holmes, Harper Buston, Cleo Buston, and Zoe Poliak. I am Heather Funk. I'm a member of the Adult Committee that provides planning and support for the Junior Canadian Rangers program. Sherry G started this program 10 years ago. We have seen many youth from varied backgrounds come through the program and all have benefited. This year, we currently have 28 youth registered. That's a lot of kids from 12 to 18 years. There's no cost for youth to join. We do a lot of off-season camping with the youth and need equipment better suited for the cooler camping we're doing. We're asking for a large dehydrator. This will be used to teach the youth food preparation for backcountry camping. The primary focus will be fo on fruit leathers and jerky, helping teach the kids food preservation. Also asking for three MSR Whisper Light Universal Stoves, four piece dish sets, including cups, bowls, and plates, two 40 quart stock pots, because feeding 28 youth and liters takes a lot of big pots. <laughs> a 16 inch frying pan, cast iron griddle, three nesting pot sets used for use on the Whisper Light stoves, two repair kits for the Whisper Light stoves, and 15 winter rated thermorests for the kids to sleep on. These items help us take the youth outside and teach them valuable backcountry skills, help them feed them and keep them warm as we all know a successful camping trip is warmth and food. The total amount we're asking for is just under $5,000. Zoe? We sure. Um. We are like the, I don't know how to start it. <laughs> established in April? No, uh, we were established in April of 2012 and there's over 100 JCRs have participated in the program in the last 10 years. There are the three main circles of learning. There's the traditional skills, which is like um, hunting and track like following tracks and stuff. And there's ranger skills, which is just like um, learning and living in the backcountry and not depending on anyone else and just like thriving with your own resources. And like life skills, like building fires, providing for yourself with the, the pots and the pans and the food that we are asking for with the money and just like main life skills and ranger skills would helps a lot throughout this. The traditional skills are like art, music, food, games, crafts, and history. With art, we like, we make a lot of traditional art and we have a lot of fun during like music. And with food, we learn how to maintain ourselves and create food for ourselves in the backcountry. Like when we're out there, we cook for ourselves. No, the adults never cook for us. We have to cook for ourselves. We like. We just went on a camping trip, and we like. She's like, "Oh, Sherry, like, when's our next meal? What are we eating?" She's like, uh, "That's up to you. Th th you you are making that. That is all up to you." And we just. It's also about fun and learning about like how to treat yourself right. And during that, you have to like enjoy doing it because if you don't enjoy it you won't like continue with it and we learn about like history of a lot of stuff and like what people have done in junior canadian rangers in the past for like all of this stuff and with like life skills there's community involvement so we can like um in the past i'm pretty sure we have chopped wood and we cl clean up and stuff and we help a lot of others handling stress and healthy activities and resolving conflicts with like social activities and learning how to like engage with others. And ranger skills is 
safety, safe firearm handling, navigation, emergency survival, all season camping, fire building, and first aid. Because we have to like maintain for ourselves because the adults are just there to make sure we don't die. <laughs> In community service, we like highway garbage cleanup to, because this is like our future town and we want to make it a better place for us to survive. And the community partnership, RCMP Firewood for Seniors. We like, in the past, we have created, like, what, done a lot of stuff for the community to help it become a better place. And we respect and remember, like, we, s we serve for our country and stuff. <laughs> So we do have one question from the committee, and that is, is the society planning on applying for other grants for this project? No, sorry. <laughs> no, we're not. One word, perfect. That, that, uh, that takes care of that. Anybody in the crowd uh, looking to ask any questions from, from this applicant? Still being shy, we'll, we'll ask again. Give it a couple seconds. Anybody, anybody have any questions? So um, my question is, can they use more funding than what they've requested to get more, to get more equipment, to more tools, etc.? Yes, we could. So can we? So can the committee um, vote to do that? I don't know how that works with CBD. I don't think so. So just to make sure everybody could hear it there at home. The uh, question was, could the society use more funds if they were available and could the committee decide to allocate more uh, as the program is undersubscribed? So something that I understand the committee will take a look at, but uh, always more funding uh, could be used if it were to be available. All right, thank you. Any, any further questions? All right, seeing none, uh, our next, oh, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jamie Mintz. I'm the president of the Valmont Curling Club and this is my partner, Ken. <clears throat> so, the Valmont Curling Club was built in 1992. You can turn it on. Next one. Uh, we currently have 304 members this season and we have a league of two nights a week with two nights of drop-in. So we are operating a junior curling program and we approximately have a dozen school aged children that attend. Um, the, we are the home to the V Crew Youth Center. It's located in the basement. Um, we're also, also a multi-use facility. So the Valmont Curling Club is also using the upstairs as a training center for other community stakeholders. Right now, currently um, the pipeline project. So we are asking you for your support. In this project, we would like to remove and replace unsanitary carpet in the torn linoleum. We would also, um, sorry, we would like to remove and recycle the old inefficient lighting with the new efficient LED lighting inside and outside of the building. We believe these upgrades will make the building safer, more sanitary, and reduce the cost of our hydro bills. The old carpet is unsanitary and stained, and it's basically uncleanable. <clears throat> so we would like to replace the carpet with this EcoFlex flooring made from recycled tires. This is a durable, easy to maintain product that will provide the club with a safer and more sanitary environment. We 
We would also like to change the lighting. Um, so we have a great team at the Valmont Curling Club who are dedicated to making sure the community of Valmont has the ability to curl and that we have a safe and bright and clean building that is available to the community. We have estimated that these volunteers will be putting in approximately 126 volunteer hours. We estimate the value of this volunteer work to be $11,200 of our own time. We are also dedicated to the maintenance of this building upgrade to ensure that they last for years and years to come. We are looking forward to many, many more years of curling in this building. We believe that the curling is a very inexpensive sport that is accessible to everyone young and old. We welcome everyone come out and throw a rock. Thank you for your time and consideration of our application. So we do have two committee questions. Uh, the first one, is the flooring and lighting being upgraded on all levels of the building, including the basement area that youth groups use? No. So the, f the flooring will not be upgraded in the basement or on the, le the first level floor. So it will go up the stairs into the lounge as well as around the ice surface. Thank you. And the committee's second question, uh, mold was mentioned. Is there an issue of mold in the facility generally, and has this ever been examined or tested? Um, I'm going to answer no, but we do suspect mold around the ice surface that we maintain twice a year. Thank you so much. Those are the committee's questions. Are there any questions from the crowd? Everybody wants to get out and throw rocks. Nobody <laughs> wants to ask any questions. Hey, Eric. On, on the, that last question, uh, on, on the last question, I guess uh, what Jamie's referring to is primarily when the ice is going in and coming out, the humidity is very high. So that uh, we can see some effect some years uh, on the concrete wall, and that's removed if, if there's any that, that does show up during that process. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, third and final call for questions from the crowd for these applicants. Seeing none, I'll ask you for another round of applause. <laughs> and next up, we have the Belmont Secondary School Parent Advisory Council Society. See the template I used uh, had food photography in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, this on my right is Francis Leclerc, and on my left, Jennifer Schiller, uh, president and representatives of the Vailmont Secondary School PAC, um, and supportive of this uh, this grant request. Um, as we all know, we're home to an amazing trail network. Uh, it is truly world class. Um, however, access to the park we, is capable bikes are required. Um, and skills are required to do that. Uh, I've been here for, this is my second year here, teaching at the high school, and uh, we have no shortage of talented, uh, exceptional youth. However, there is, um, there is not as many kids riding as I would have expected. Um, just to support this project, there's been a lot of research that's shown uh, youth who participate in sport, and cycling specifically, they have increased physical um, health outcomes, higher self-esteem, increased mental health, better to cap capacity to handle stress and increased focus during the day. This is um, all from research from uh, an organization called Outride that uh, gets bikes to youth uh, and does a lot of research on the impact of getting bikes to youth. Uh, my propo or our proposal, uh, we're looking to get 15 bikes uh, for the community, for youth, for extracurricular programming uh, these are, this is actually a picture of the bike we're trying to get. They're called the Kona Process. Highly capable bikes, uh, ideal for riding uh, all the trails in the area and in the bike park. 
Kona Bicycles has been really generous and so has District Bicycles and uh, they've partnered with this project to supply the bikes at a 40% discount. So if anyone here has bought a bike, they know how expensive they are and how prohibitively uh, expensive they can be. This pro the proposal also includes a fair number of tools, um, stands, bike pumps to supply um, and support the program. So the program we would be teaching youth how to, uh, how to maintain bikes and how to support um, this hopefully really healthy lifelong addiction they'll develop. Uh, the proposal also includes helmets and safety gear, some elbow and knee pads. Um, and overall, like with all the equipment, we've got over $25,000 being donated in kind from District Bicycles and Kona. Um, pretty substantial. The proposal includes um, coaching at the heart of it. So getting kids out, providing them with instruction to teach them how to ride safely. Uh, there's a lot of big features in that bike park. Uh, a lot of injuries are acquired. It's a part of the sport, but done safely and appropriately. Uh, it can be just a lifetime of joy. And uh, I don't come to this as just a, a recreational rider. I spent uh, a lot of my life uh, on bikes, racing bikes. And the last, uh, or before I moved here, I spent over 10 years coaching uh, full time. And so I was run, ran provincial programs for Ontario and Alberta as their provincial coach. Uh, so I have a lot of experience running uh, and building programs and feel like this is a real opportunity to revive uh, a once very active uh, youth mountain bike programming that was here in the community that has gone away. So really excited to, uh, to get involved and, uh, and see a program uh, thrive again. Our operational plan, our uh, funding will flow through the secondary school pack. Um, we have secure storage here at the high school. We'll be partnering with uh, District Bikes and Kona Bikes for, uh, for lots of our gear. We'll have weekly coached rides and uh, mechanical repair sessions. So I also have a long history of being a bike mechanic. I've traveled the world doing that and um, yeah, I'm capable in that realm as well. So we also have also, there's lots of people in the community that have these skills and District Bikes again has expressed interest in partnering us there. Um, so our total request is substantial at just under $43,000, but this is a long-term investment in the youth in our community. <clears throat> Uh, expected to see some results in increased participation in mountain biking uh, due to reducing financial barriers. Certainly increased riding and maintenance skills by the participants, increased physical health and mental well-being. Hope to see some increased self-esteem and self-confidence and certainly some capacity for Vail Mounts youth. Uh, there's lots of jobs available working in the bike industry and this is a great gateway. Um, lots of community engagement as well. The community has been really um, Fortunate to have lots of trail building and lots of access, so um, hope to get our youth involved with some of that as well. Uh, just a couple quotes from some previous participants the last two years. Um, riding with the club has taught me not only to be a better rider, but also many types of bike maintenance that was needed. So I've needed to find and pay for repairs to my bike, which put a halt on repairs. As a temporary fix, I was able to borrow a bike. So I was loaning out my own personal bikes previously, or well, I still will if they're needed, but uh, and my, using my own tools to, uh, to help students in uh, the community to ride. So, all right, that's all I got. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. We, we do have two questions from the committee. Um, the first question is, where do the insurance costs come from to run this program? So, uh, provided that all the students that are participating are students of uh, either the elementary school or the secondary school, uh, the insurance would fall under the school's insurance. And so uh, that's where insurance would be provided. If we had students coming from outside the school, we'd need to look at potentially partnering with uh, Cycling BC and acquiring insurance through there. Um, I've already started that conversation just in the event that that, that does happen, but we are covered uh, through the insurance through the school district. Um, and that's, that's across the board uh, in other school districts and with other schools in this school district who I've been in contact with and just trying to find all the best practices that are uh, across the province. Um, all of the other schools that I've talked to have been using the, uh, the board insurance that's available. Thank you for that. And, and one further question. Um, if there are major repairs required for the bikes, how will the organization fund the parts required to fix them? 
Um, so in the, in the proposal, some, I have a, a small list of repair parts, sort of the ex, um, regular, I don't know, I guess you could call them consumable parts um, for a short term are included in that proposal. Long term, we need to be doing some fundraising. Um, an example is on Friday night at the movie that was here, we had, our, we had a booth set up doing concession. We raised a bit of money there, and so we continue to do that uh, and other community outreach projects to hopefully generate some, uh, some revenue that way. Thank you. Are there any questions from the crowd for the South Right here, if you don't mind coming to the mic, thank you. Hi. Uh, so is the um, is it going to be a course in school or an after school program? Yeah, it's all uh, outside of school time. And so uh, what I had done last year and in the spring this year was just offered uh, one or two days a week of riding. And so that included coach sessions. So we'd meet either in the bike park or even in the parking lot here uh, outside of school time. And can this uh, benefit kids as far as, because um, there's some sort of system, right, where they get credits for out-of-school activities for graduation, does it go uh, So that? if there was volunteer work that they were doing, they could use those volunteer hours towards um, that requirement for their, uh, their Dogwood diploma. Um, but I haven't looked at incorporating any sort of mountain bike component into a, a school program for credit. Uh, and this is, this is purely for recreation and for mental health and well-being. Volunteering is nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. Hi. How are you? Uh, is there any cost for the kids to use the equipment and take your time and stuff like that? Or is that what this is all about? That's what this is all about. Yeah. So it, there's so no cost. No to cost. No. No. So I'm really hoping that uh, youth in the community can come out if they need a bike. There's some there for them. Uh, if they need a helmet, there's helmets there for them. If they need elbow or knee pads, there's those there for them as well. And is it just going to be on a first come, first serve? You know, essentially, there's, yes. There's a lot more kids than that. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, and, you know, what I did to come up with that number was looked at the numbers we have here in the high school um, and just reaching out and polling students who would be interested even if there weren't if there were bikes available um, and that's where I sort of came up with that number and then also looking at the elementary school uh, I don't know that uh, these bikes would necessarily fit all the elementary kids but at least in the upper grades I'm hoping that uh, there would be some availability for maybe some of the grade six seven students um, to access some of these bikes. I've, I've looked at ordering the smallest bikes possible in that range that I uh, had up earlier. And uh, speaking with uh, some of the elementary teachers who run some of that mountain bike club at the elementary school, they're keen to partner as well and coordinate our rides based on ability level rather than age. So. And will this course be charged anything to use the bike app? Uh, there's no there's no cost to use yeah. the bike park. Um, you can if you can pedal up there, you've earned your turns, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So there's no charge there. Okay, thanks. Thank you for those questions to follow up. We we have one more. One more. Perfect. I love I love the questions. So keep them coming. You uh, you mentioned twenty five thousand of in kind funding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is so that would be over and above if you receive the forty-two thousand that you're asking for. Would that sort of turn into sixty-seven thousand, or is that in kind essentially? Funding? Yeah. So what it is is um, the budget that I've laid out. The bikes. If I was paying full retail for everything, it would be over sixty-five thousand dollars. Okay, so that's and essentially so the discounts that you're receiving. The discounts from, the from all the industry okay, partners. Right. Yeah. So that doesn't represent your time. Or that's correct. It doesn't in involve coaches' Perfect. hours or anything. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We got one more, it looks like. Uh, we had a few uh, with less questions, so let's, uh, let's take it. You guys can't get away from not hearing from me. <laughs> uh, Sean, I just want to say this is an amazing project. We know how much time, or I know how much time and energy you've put into this. Um, 15 bikes is a pile of bikes for the size of the community that you have. Uh, especially for the quality that we have. I think you were modest on some of your qualifications and I think it's important to know um, these people to know how valuable he is to our community and to these children and the skills that he can't give them. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Well, I think
think that's a, that's a great note to, to let you away from the podium. Thanks right, so cheers. much. Thanks, everybody. So the next thing that we're going to do is just take a brief intermission. Um, what I'd encourage you to do is uh, go out and visit the secondary school's table there where they're selling their goodies. Uh, if you didn't catch the signs, they're raising funds for uh, the BC Youth Parliament in Camp Phoenix, so one program that takes folks down to uh, sit in the legislative building uh, over the Christmas holidays and you know uh, get to be exposed to all the stuff that Victoria has to offer, and the other that is summer camp programs. So if we could take 10 minutes to use the facilities, check out that table, and I'll have you back here at 327. 327. Thank you so much. Well, we'll call up the Robinson Valley Spay and Neuter Society. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Do I have this going right? Just push it there. there we go. Uh, my name is Susan Prue, and I'm representing the Community Spay Neuter Support Project this afternoon, and we're requesting $4,000. So first of all, our mandate is to promote res responsible pet ownership, and we provide education and financial assistance to help control cat and dog populations in the Robson Valley. Some background, RVSM was formed in 2013 to address the feral and stray cat populations in the valley. We received grant funding from BCSPCA uh, to help address the needs of three feral cat populations. Our next step was looking at the source of these stray. Oh, you're laughing at the picture. <laughs> I know, aren't they adorable? But there's too many of them. Uh, so we wanted to address the source of this, these stray animals and the ferals, which were owned cats. So we applied for funds to assist with the cost of spay neutering for owned cats and extend our outreach to owned dogs as well. Uh, we really wish to remove the financial barriers that people face. We do quite a bit of fundraising. Uh, we participate in craft fairs, festivals, concessions, raffles, barbecues, spaghetti dinners, highway cleanups uh, to help generate funds and always to raise awareness. We also apply for donations and grants. Uh, we've had great community support with donations of food, supplies and cash. And we also apply for grants to other agencies uh, such as the Regional District, Fraser Fort George, uh, BC, SBCA, and of course, um, CBT. The big picture with our organization is that we are completely voluntarily run. Uh, we reach out to the community to, to raise awareness that assistance is available. We help book vet, vet appointments, uh, live trap feral cats, care for stray cats, shelter and rehome cats, and apply for funding as well to help cover vet fees. The Society addresses population issues in Valmont, Tijon, Dunster, McBride, and surrounding areas. Funding for areas outside of Valmont includes RDFFG uh, donations and fundraising. We also connect with other rescues to help relocate kittens. Uh, there's like too many who can't find phones, homes here. Uh, from the Robson Valley, and we work with the Okanagan when possible. We are also currently working on several colonies of, of feral cats with funds from BCSPCA. We have a lovely new cat shelter. Uh, this is a safe, warm place for fosters to heal up from surgery and either return them to their colony or to go to their new forever homes. This was renovated completely through volunteer work. So why spay and neuter? Healthy pets. Alter pets means less roaming, fighting, and injuries, less unwanted pregnancies, less stray animals, to reduce the number of unwanted animals and overcrowded shelters, which is currently getting to be more and more of a problem. The average costs, uh, you can see for cats and dogs there. Our local vet clinic <coughs> does support our project by offering us discounted rates 
So our financial statement, as you can see, our total revenue from for last year was $15,444. And our expenses, there's a list of our expenses, was just over $12,000. Thank you. Progress. Uh, since 2013, we have taken care of almost 650 animals. In 2022, that included 20 in the Valmont area and 35 in the Tijon, Dunster, McBride area for a total of 55 animals. This has had a huge impact on the health of the animal population in the valley, but there's still work to be done. Our projected budget for um, next year is $4,000. Uh, we're looking at potentially for 12 own cats or strays and five dogs. Our project is very important, uh, more so now with owners struggling with rising costs of day-to-day -day living. Many people are unaware of the costs involved with spay neutering and either postpone or fail to fix their animals at all due to financial shortfalls. Um, the bottom line is altered pets are healthier and we want to prevent unwanted litters. Thank you so much. We do have two questions from the committee. Uh, the first question is, how does the society raise awareness to prevent unwanted litters? Uh, quite a number of ways, actually. Uh, through social media, we have a, a Facebook page that gains a lot of attention. So just through information, responses there. Uh, we have posters around. Uh, word of mouth is very big to get our word out, uh, recommendations. Uh, through the vet clinic, uh, through fundraisers, we always try to maintain a, a presence when there's things going on in the community. And of course, one-to-one -one, uh, and through volunteers. Thank you very much. And the second question from the committee, uh, what will the eligibility criteria be for pet owners to receive financial assistance? Uh, thank you. Yeah, first of all, uh, they do need to live in Valmont in the village, be a residence, um, express a need for assistance, so come and ask, and have not had uh, repeated assistance multiple times before. We try to like fit in education as a part of what we do. Um, we do ask that they try to contribute at least half if they are able to. Um, of the cost or what they can afford. Um, the bottom line we usually look at, it's about the animal. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the crowd? Seeing a few hands going up. Hello. Hi. Um, we will you be litter picking this year? Pardon me? Litter picking, will you be doing that again this year? Um, I'm not absolutely sure. We do try to do that as a fundraiser. We're looking at other ways. We've, we've, it's sort of a combination, like we want to give back to the community, but with just our small group of people that are on the board, it gets to be quite a lot to do. But we, we kind of assess that every year or see if we can encourage people that we've helped to come out and join us when we do litter pickup. Okay, I'm gonna give a shout out now to it. Um, it's a great form of exercise. <laughs> it is. You get out in the fresh air. It's really why I stood up, to be honest, just to give, give a shout out to people and encourage people to come along and do it. I've done it for a few years, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. Honestly. Absolutely. Um, so please uh, do it or pass the message along and get yourselves out there to do it. It's wonderful and it's good for the soul. Yes, thank you so much for that. A uh, quick question on the feral colonies. Uh, we continue to hear about it. Uh, so i safe to assume these are unowned cats. They are just a colony of cats that live somewhere. Usually what we find is they are on somebody's property. So it can be a result of people dumping animals in rural areas and they congregate. And it can be sometimes uh, some resistance on the part of whoever happens to be living there, where they'll, you know, they'll allow us, because we have to have permission if it's private property. Usually what happens is someone will phone in and say, hey, there's all these cats. 
Um, we do need permission from the owner to go in and trap. And sometimes they'll just say, yeah, you can take all of them except for this one, because I love this one so much. Uh, so education is a huge, huge part of what we do. And it, it does get frustrating. And you might think, like, why do you continue to do this? Because they're just going to keep on having babies. But over the 10 years of being involved, we've really seen a drop in numbers, which is, and even like with some of the ferals communities, when you go in, you can just see the level of the health of animals is horrendous. And if we have to go in and we're cleaning out the same colony over several years, we do see an improvement in numbers and the health just because there's fewer, fewer animals. Okay, but it's ongoing sort of led to the second part of my quick question and is you know because you mentioned live trapping neutering and then putting them back in the colony whether this was a sustainable exercise if you're seeing an improvement in numbers because we all know how fast cats breed yeah. right so yeah. if it looks like it's a sustainable thing then that was my question too thank you yeah thank you Next presenters that we're looking for are the Vale Mont uh, Community Sports Day Association. Hello, I'm Laura. I'm the president of the Vale Mont Community Sports Day Association. This is Stephanie. She's on the board as well. So we are applying for money towards our kids' activities and events for this year. Uh, it's really important to the current board that we keep these free for everybody so that there's no barrier uh, for people to participate. I'll just go over quickly what Ville Mountain Days is, although I think most of you in here already know, but we'll just... So uh, this year's festival, again, will be three days long, starting Friday and going until Sunday. Friday night is uh, a street party, again, very kid-oriented. Uh, we plan to have a clown there again, live music, face painting. Um, yeah, last year the weather really cooperated, which made it awesome. Um, Saturday, of course, is the parade. And what I really love about the parade is it is another very low barrier event, like if you have a walker or a wheelchair, you can still drive up and watch and participate, and the kids love it. Um, so the other things on Saturday, bouncy castles, um, baseball, concession, uh, beer garden, and uh, other events on the sports grounds, which we are just in the, in the stage of organizing. We hope to have a few more diff different events um, this year for different age groups and whatnot. Sunday uh, will be logger sports. Last year we rushed to at least do some of them. This year we're hope, hoping to do a few more of the classic ones. Um, and of course, more baseball and bouncy castles and clown. And yeah, okay, I'm not actually done. <laughs> so I'll just break down what we're applying for. Uh, so the arena rental itself is about $1,000. Um, Chris the Clown for three days is just under 3000 and the bouncy castles and photo booth rental comes to almost 7000 So big numbers. Um, last year we were fortunate to get uh, sponsorship from LEDCOR for the bouncy castles at least. Um, this year we are applying for this gr grant program. We do apply for other grants uh, for um, the weekend but those grants don't cover our whole budget. So we're left with a certain amount that we have to kind of every year decide, improvise where we're gonna get that money from. Um, I think especially after the lockdowns with COVID, it's become clear to many that events like this, community events are, are so important. And especially events that involve all ages. So. 
Um, for me, it's, it's really a great time to just be out there with community members and having fun together, which is something that, you know, often we're working together or we're fundraising together, but when are we having fun together? So this is kind of that, that opportunity. Anything you want to add? Okay. All right. Now I am done. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we do have two questions from the committee. Uh, the first question, were other funding opportunities or grants also pursued for this project? Yes, so this amount um, covers roughly 40, 40 to 50% of our total budget. So there's quite a bit of money there that we get from other sources, grants, fundraising, and sponsorship. Thank you very much. And the, the second committee question is, will the grant funding for this project benefit the community uh, beyond the weekend in question? Absolutely. I think that um, despite it being a, only a three-day event, um, the lasting benefits from this is just the social uh, cohesion that, that occurs from an event like this where you're out there with different people that you may not see all the time. And for kids, you know, they're active. It's like a way of getting them outside and having fun together. Um, so I, I, do, I do believe that there's lasting benefits to the community from this. Thank you very much. Any questions from the crowd? Hi. Hello. Have you ever thought of just buying bouncy castles rather than every year spending a lot of money? And then they could be used different times and throughout the summer season rather than just the three days? Yes. Um, we... Because that's a lot of money to spend continuously every year. The, the life of a bouncy castle is not that long. So we, we have taken some preliminary steps into looking into it. It doesn't look like it's, it would be a huge win, uh, but we are looking into it. Uh, the lifespan of a commercial bouncy castle is between three and five years, and then the cost of buying it is between 3,000 and 5,000. To rent it, it's about $500 a day per bouncy castle. So anyway, that's a lot of numbers, but basically you're not saving a Ton of money if you buy the bouncy castles, the insurance will go sky high. That's that's the other part. So once it yeah. rent, so they come with their own insurance. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I didn't know that. The, the insurance, yeah, and I'm not sure what the insurance would be because we haven't gotten our quote yet, but uh, obviously that would go up and as well as storage, like, uh, yeah. That's Thank you very much for that. Uh, seeing a hand in the middle of the room, the most uh, challenging question. just a thought that came to me. I realize you two are on this committee, but if somebody wanted to add to the program, say everybody washes their car and gets it really nice, to have a show and shine or something could volunteer to do it or, or would... Absolutely. This is a closed club. Let <laughs> <laughs> by, by no means. So here's my little pitch please uh, if you're interested in either your club doing some sort of demonstration that weekend or even some fundraising um, we want to hear from everybody and uh, I do plan to send out a, a note to all of the local nonprofits about that opportunity and then if anyone would like to volunteer we are always in need of volunteers that weekend we try and keep it as minimal as possible because we want people to enjoy the weekend as well we don't want it to just become everyone's like you know work in the door or something but yeah okay. you're going to be on my list okay <laughs> that's fine that's something um, as a recent import to the community i just want to give a huge shout out that um Moving here in COVID and meeting people through various stuff, uh, we met a ton of awesome people. Um, but Vail Mountain Days last year was the thing that made us decide to, to stay in the community, honestly, was just seeing everyone coming out, meeting a lot of cool new people, and just seeing just how truly great this community is and how much it punches above its size in arts and culture and sports and everything. So just huge shout out. Thank you so much.
Um, have we applied or tried to get the um, arena rental um, just for free? Um, there is a grant we apply for, um, but uh, typically it, it's an open-ended grant, so it goes into our operating funds. Um, yeah. I just would have thought in the interests of what this is that they might have just waived the fees, but... Yeah, uh, we, what ends up happening is we end up paying the arena rental. We do apply to a regional district grant program, okay. uh, so we, get, we do get money from the regional district, but it's kind of two separate activities so okay. yeah and um, yeah that money usually goes towards like insurance for example and okay yeah yeah, yeah. okay all right thanks yes. thank you for all those questions uh, not seeing any more at the moment another round of applause for our presenters <laughs> and now inviting the Belmont Entertainment Society to take the podium. I said stand earlier, but that maybe has a negative uh, connotation. Pick the podium. Well, here I am on the stand. I'd like my lawyer present, please. Uh, so we don't have a really exciting, sexy project this year, but we do have one that's uh, very necessary. Uh, just a little background. So uh, as you all know, we've been here several times over the last few years working on a conversion of all the channels from analog to digital. We have one more that we haven't done, and we actually kind of hoped not to have to do it. It is uh, channel 32. Now for those of you who aren't familiar, channel 32 is used to send our content from VCTV up to Five Mile Road to the transmitter and then it's broadcast on channel 7. We had hoped because it's just a trans, what they call a transmitter link that we would not have to convert it. But unfortunately the federal government says yes, you must convert it and um, uh, so we will have to do that this year, uh, convert it to digital. It will be broadcast to the community, so you'll be able to see Channel 7 content, VCTV content, on Channel 32 or Channel 7. So uh, we need some equipment at the studio site and at the head end to be able to, uh, to do that. Uh, it's a requirement of the, uh, of the federal government. Uh, once the channel has turned to digital, we'll also have to add the emergency alert system. So this is uh, not the buoyant alert, don't get it confused with that, but this is the emergency system you may have seen if you're ever in a city where there's a storm approaching or something, it breaks into the programming and says uh, there is an upcoming uh, weather event or some sort of local emergency. It's coded, what they call geocoded for our region, so it's sent out of uh, Ottawa or Toronto, somewhere down east, but it's coded so that only, we only get the messages uh, applicable to this area. So because it's going to be digital, all television stations must broadcast the emergency alerts, which is a nice companion for us because we also have the Valemount uh, emergency radio system, uh, which is active here as well. So we'll now have a radio and a television component for that. Um, it is a... Uh, uh, as I said, not a very exciting project, and I don't even have any pictures to show you here for it, but it just requires some equipment that we put in, technical equipment at the station, uh, some equipment at the, uh, what we call the head end or the transmitter, and the emergency alert system as well, and we're asking for, uh, the total cost is $40,354, and that will be our last I promise, last channel that converts to digital. And then we'll be also be adding our uh, four other programs on channel seven this year. So there'll be seven, uh, 102 to 7105 uh, in digital, and that'll give us uh, 20 digital channels. And that's my presentation, so I'm open for questions. We, we do have one question from the committee. Are there any other grant streams available for the society to apply for if this ready grant application is unsuccessful? Thank you. We have looked at other uh, grant sources. Um, this is a very technical uh, field and the only one that we were able to find was the uh, Columbia Basin uh, Trust tech grant program, which they offer, not every year, but, but some years. It has a cap on it. I, I was looking for the, for the amount, but I couldn't find it. But I, I seem to recall it being five or $10,000, so this project would not qualify for it, although the emergency alert system uh, component of it would, because that's uh, $3,000. But unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be another applicable grant that we can apply for. Thank you very much for that. I'm looking for questions from the crowd. I know it's not very exciting.
but it's necessary. We have to do it. The government says so. And uh, I have a second offer. All right, seeing no questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Looking for the Creekside Opportunity Village, uh, pardon me, the Creekside Outreach Society with their Opportunity Village project. I don't know, but y'all look way different from up here. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm Leanne, and this is Christine. We're two of the directors from the Creekside Outreach Society, and this is David Balcony, our project manager. Um, if we say who is the Creekside Outreach Society, most of you would be more familiar if I said the Great Room. We're a program that was developed in 2019 to provide support to those in our community and surrounding areas who are vulnerable, marginalized, and at risk. Creekside has successfully operated the Great Room for the last four years, and we've identified many areas where individuals struggle to get by daily. Often clients are forced to make the choice between rent, food, bills, and medication for various reasons. Left unsupported, this can lead to physical and mental health conditions, anxiety, depression, addictions, crime, and even homelessness, and even suicide. What is Creekside Opportunity Village? COV will be a supported living facility providing housing and meals in a community or village setting while imparting a much needed sense of family and belonging. This helps develop structure, life skills, the structure and life skills relating to taking care of yourself, your home, and becoming more independent and confident. Residents will be hands-on to assist with daily operations, learning skill sets that assist them in becoming employable. The, this unique design will offer a commercial kitchen and dining hall that provide meals and services to the residents and the community, ensuring proper nutrition is available to all those that struggle with food insecurity. Designed with offices and meeting rooms, residents will be able to easily meet with incoming support services, counselors, and visiting ministries that normally have to be accessed off-site, helping reduce stress, anxiety, and missed appointments. Creekside Opportunity Village is not a seniors housing project. This will be the, for those ages 18 to 55. There are currently no supported housing facilities within the region and no place for those that are struggling to go. While working with other community agencies, Creekside will continue to bridge the gaps in services and provide services that don't currently exist, such as supports for men, emergency services, services, temporary accommodations, and crisis assistance. The proposed housing complex is a working village built on two to three acres within the village, uh, requesting land from the village in principle, just off of Ash Street, south of the community gardens behind the secondary school. Our team, the Creekside Outreach Society, has started the ball rolling, and now with our project manager, David Balcony of Code Project Enterprises, his team brings great knowledge and experience that can address the need for projects like this. The need for housing with support for vulnerable people is becoming more and more recognized. As we see that the current housing system is not working, and many of us have witnessed or experienced firsthand the devastating effects of what happens when people fall through the cracks. The additional supports provided through supportive housing will have a tremendous life-changing impacts on the health and well-being of the residents, pairing support, meals, and housing to people who are currently living in distress will not only improve their quality of life, but will improve the quality of life for the entire village. So you can help us today. We're applying to the CBT Ready Grant for phase one of the project in the amount of $40,000. This will fund the conceptual drawings and the engineer work, move it, moving the designs that we showed you upstairs into architectural build print, prints and allowing us to, to request land in principle, secure our investors, and see Opportunity Village come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we do have two questions from the committee. Uh, the first question is, how has the organization cl 
Pardon me. Has the organization collaborated with other community organizations to offer the services that have been proposed? And are there letters of support from these businesses and agencies? Yes, since we first started operating, we've been working with many of the existing agencies within the community, uh, Village Greens, RVCS, uh, Emergency Services, as well as the clinic and different places. We've got a few support letters and some to come, still more meetings ahead, and plan to definitely want to continue to work with all those agencies for a project like this. It's going to take a whole village. Thank you very much. And the second question, if the request of the Village of Belmont to donate land in principle is not supported, are there other options available to the organization to purchase land? Uh, we do have a couple other options available. Ideally, we would love to see the approval through Council, not only because of the zoning that's required for the project, but to have the project central within the community provides ease of access for the residents and the clients. Thank you very much. And questions from the crowd? Uh, can, is this, is it a male only? No, it's, it would be for anybody that would require supported living. So that, you know, that can look different for everybody based on the level that's required. Uh, basically, generally all the clients that we would serve, they are living independently and able to live independently now, but would all benefit from additional supports. And how do you determine eligibility? Uh, there would have to be an intake process that's definitely further down the road we would look at probably referrals from doctors and what have you and a board of directors that would have a criteria set and then they would do review and intake to see what needs the client had and is this um is this the great room i thought the great room was a religious organization no the great the great room is a program of the creekside society we're located within the church but we're not the church Okay, thank you. It's me again. Um, how close is this uh, plan to be near the new seniors um, complex? And um, if it's close, do you foresee any issues in that? Uh, if approved, we're proposing to be adjacent to the community garden, so it would be behind the new seniors project and don't see any problem with the two of them being that close. We actually serve quite a few seniors, and we, one of the bonuses, I guess, that we would be looking at is that where we're located right now is downstairs, and there's no elevator, and it prevents a lot of accessibility issues for some of the seniors. So we would look forward to having a level entry building but by no means we would want to, we want to continue to work with the agencies that are already providing services and sort of offer a one-stop shop we don't want to duplicate or you know recreate the wheel when it comes to doing something new there's a lot of good resources that the village already offers it's bridging the gap so that clients are finding the services and pairing people together okay thank you Is this just going to be for the Robson Valley people? Or are you going to be bringing people in from other communities? No, our target our target market and our focus is definitely for the the people of the Robson Valley. Okay. So focusing our services there. Thank you very much for those questions. Are there are there any others? We might be getting close to your last chance to get up to a mic if you're. If you've been waiting. All right, seeing none, I'll ask for another round of applause. Thank you very much.
So that was our last presentation of the day. So I, I, again, I just thank you all so much for being here this afternoon, for taking the time to develop these programs. And your next step in this is to vote. So we have this facility available to us till 4.30. I, I believe folks are likely to spend a little bit of time out front, but if you would like to use the QR code or the paper applications, there we go. QR code or the paper applications to cast your votes, please do so before you depart. Uh, we, we really appreciate that. Um, and a shout out to the folks that put today together on the timetable I was given. It said 4.10 we were going to hit this point and it's 4.05, so that's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, if there aren't any questions, I'll invite you to take this time to vote and again, enjoy the rest of your Sunday.